Okay, it's five past now. So I think I'm just gonna go ahead and start. And if people come in, then they come in and then they'll just catch up when they can. So um, hi everyone, my name is Vera Tuomola. I'm from the Humlog Institute at the Hunkin School of Economics. And I'm the postdoctoral researcher for the REC project. Um, so as you know, um, within REC, we focus on environmental sustainability in humanitarian logistics. And our goal is to really enable humanitarian logistics partners to reduce their impact on the environment. And um, REC is of course an acronym, which we love both in academia and the humanitarian world. So uh, the whole name of the project is Waste Management and Measuring Reverse Logistics, Environmentally Sustainable Procurement and Transport and Circular Economy. So it is quite a mouthful. So let's just keep to REC for now. Um, so in this uh, workshop and presentation, we're gonna discuss the qualitative study part, which is um, the part that Honken does. And we're gonna first give an overview, or I'm gonna first give an overview of the, um, the study that we've done so far, including the literature review and some of the empirical um, studies that we've done. And then we'll have a discussion in breakout rooms afterwards. Um, so this is the Honken team. Um, as said, we are doing the qualitative part of the study. So our PI, principal investigator, is Professor Junji Kovacs, who a lot of you probably are familiar with. Then there's myself, Yara Tuomala, I am the postdoc. And then we have Dr. Anna Aminov. She's an associate professor here at Hanken, and her um, main field of study is procurement and sustainability, a circular economy. So she's our main expert on those themes. So if you have any questions, um, on any of the themes today, please feel free to reach out, um, maybe after the presentation, <laughs> rather. Um, at, if at any point anybody has any questions, please write them in the chat and Catherine will then um, make sure that they go to the right um, recipient. Uh, so first we'll start off with a quick introduction to the study. So as mentioned, the focus is on waste management and reverse logistics within the humanitarian context. Um, uh, recently, a lot of humanitarian organi organizations have become aware of the environmental impact, and there has even been some criticism uh, towards humanitarian organizations regarding their um, environmental practices or lack thereof. Um, so we set out uh, within the confines of the REC, uh, REC project to do a qualitative study, which begins with, uh, which we started off in January with a literature review uh, where we covered academic literature as well as um, gray literature, which uh, we really wanted to include both of these uh, types of literature because uh, humanitarian um, logistics and supply chain management is very much grounded in practice. And in the gray literature, you also have the most uh, recent publications as academia moves. Uh, fairly slowly still. Um, and then we continued the study through empirical qualitative interviews with different stakeholders from a wide range of uh, organizations that we'll go into a little bit later as well. Um, our goal was to create a framework that can be used both within research of humanitarian logistics and supply chain management, as well as practice. So this is the, the overall goal of the whole project, as well as our qualitative part of the study. And what we particularly want to highlight are challenges within environmental sustainability in humanitarian contexts and contextual differences between uh, different kinds of aid that is needed or different kinds of geographical contexts or different kinds of disasters. So for example, catering to a conflict in Ukraine is very, can be it's like different things need to be considered than for example, a typhoon in Philippines. Um, now, why is it important to consider environmental effects in the humanitarian context? So of course there's the ever so familiar do no harm mandate, which um, in recent years has gone to be expanded towards the natural environment as well. So um, a lot of humanitarian organizations have started to, 
to consider the repercussions of the operations that they might have on the environment. Um, there are also various links between sustainability dimensions and performance measures. So after maybe some initial investment, uh, doing things in a more sustainable way might actually increase performance, um, decrease costs. Um, it might actually, at the end of the day, become more, um, it will increase the performances of different organizations. Um, at the moment, uh, or in this particular study, we focus quite strongly on waste management, which is something that has been extensively explored in commercial supply chain literature, which of course, um, if you look at humanitarian logistics as a stream of research that is also, uh, it also strongly um, is inspired by commercial supply chain literature and grounded in, in logistics um, from the commercial side. So it makes sense that waste management uh, also then uh, draws from this stream. And um, reverse logistics is something that um, is very strongly covered within the commercial supply chain literature when it comes to waste management and environmental sustainability, as well as in closed loop supply chains and the circular, circular economy. Um, all of these uh, things significantly overlap within the waste management literature and waste management themes. Uh, also why considering environmental effects is becoming more and more significant or more and more relevant is because by 2020 for the first time, climate and weather events rather than conflicts were the main factor of displacement. So um, it is, it's very important for humanitarian operations to not exacerbate these types of events with, with their operations. Um, and complex emergencies are, of course, resulting from these kinds of climates and weather events. So if you have a hurricane or an earthquake in the middle of a massive political crisis, it's, you can see from the little matrix there um, with the different types of, of disasters, uh, it's very logical to think that, all, that the emergency will then be exacerbated. Um, we set out the, from the literature review, we uh, set out to do with these research questions. So our first research question is, um, what is the current state of research and practice on waste management and reverse logistics in the humanitarian context? So this is more of an overview of what is currently being done. And then our second research question is, uh, what are the gaps in waste management and reverse logistics in the humanitarian context? So this is then more about what could be done and what are the efforts that are currently under, maybe uh, people are thinking about them and motivating themselves to do. So this, especially the, the RT2 uh, is being considered within the empirical part of the study. So the, the stakeholder interviews. Um, just a quick word about the methodology of the literature review. So uh, it's what we call a state of the art review because we um, uh, use academic literature as well as the gray literature, as mentioned, because we want to have it very practically oriented. We want to uh, want it to be useful for practitioners as well as researchers. Uh, the literature review search was mostly conducted on Google Scholar and then as well ordinary Google for the non-academic sources. Um, the citation indices are often used to determine the influence of articles. So the more citations an article has, um, the more influential it is considered to be. And um, in this particular one, what was, you have some seminal papers on, for example, reverse logistics within the humanitarian context, then it, it is possible to see who has cited that paper and that way, um, it was very practical to find more recent literature, which of course was the focus of this study. We wanted it to be as recent as possible. As possible. Um, and this uh, subject is very interdisciplinary. So um, that was one of our focuses as well. And from this slide, you can see the different journals that we have um, that the, the 
literature was found from. So if you look at the list, we have a very wide range of different journals. So we have things like uh, journals such as Natural Hazards Review, Disaster Prevention and Management, um, of course, Journal of Humanitarian Logistics, but then we have the more commercial, traditional supply chain um, journals as well, such as Journal of Operations and Production Management, Production and Operations Management, Journal of Cleaner Production, um, International Journal of Logistics Management, very, very traditional commercial logistics supply chain um, journals, which just goes to show how hot <laughs> and interesting this topic is at the moment within the supply chain um, stream of research. Um, then we moved on to the interviews. So here is a list of all the, the organizations that we have interviewed. Um, so as you can see, it's mostly NGOs. Um, we have some UN representatives, and we have some academia, some donors, and then others that might be independent consultants, et cetera, that we have also managed to interview. And it's been super interesting to interview um, all of these stakeholders just to sort of validate what we found within and expand on what we found within the literature review. Um, so the way that, uh, from the literature and the interviews as well, we've um, come up with some umbrella themes and sub themes to go within the, the um, overall theme of environmental sustainability within the humanitarian context. So uh, the, uh, this is what we call the umbrella theme. So, and these uh, are the sort of sub themes that come up no matter what the subject is in terms of environmental sustainability. So climate change, of course, ever present, um, in today's world. Um, as mentioned earlier, an example of that would be climate-related displacement. Um, sustainability in any kind of context is impossible without collaboration, intra-sectoral, cross-sectoral, all kinds of partnerships are increasingly relevant when it comes to sustainability efforts within any sector. And of course, the humanitarian sector is no different. Um, localization, is uh, an integral part of collaboration. Um, local procurement is just one example. Local partnerships in terms of waste management with local waste management actors, with private companies who are doing waste management in the local area. Um, performance, uh, lean supply chain management is not something usually associated with humanitarian logistics, but um, there are some uh, studies that show that this, um, that lean supply chain management could then be, uh, become more relevant in the future. Um, there are many barriers that have come up both within the literature as well as from the, the uh, interviews. So, uh, Funding limitations is just one. There are also um, technological and infrastructural shortcomings, um, lack of knowledge of greening practices within organizations. Um, these barriers are, we need to be well aware of these barriers to better than overcome them. Um, there are uh, increasing amounts of measures and tools to measure uh, environmental impact of all kinds of operations. And one example of that is the rapid environmental impact assessment, which has been used um, in many, many contexts and many operations thus far. Then next we have um, the waste management overall theme, which is then broken down into the sub themes of material convergence, procurement, solid waste management and waste streams. Um, in terms of procurement, ICRC, for example, has a very uh, clear guide in terms uh, for greener procurement. Um, solid waste management uh, from the literature and interviews, it's uh, sort of possible to ascertain that there is a bit of a lack of solid waste plans from the get-go in terms of 
uh, when the, an operation is being planned. Of course, usually because of time constraints, resource constraints. Uh, then there are different waste streams that require different types of management plans. Uh, so packaging is one which maybe uh, is, is approached from a reduction point of view. Medical waste, for example, has to have a completely different um, uh, management plan. It has to be correctly uh, disposed of because it can be it can pre present some hazardous situations. And there's of course um, e-waste, which also becomes a, a problem if um, not disposed of properly. And then um, an issue which has become more and more relevant particularly with it during the Ukraine crisis, is material convergence, which um, actually my colleague, Professor Genji Kovacs, is going to come and talk about a little bit due to her re very recent uh, experience in Poland, helping with, uh, with the Ukraine effort. So Genji, are you ready to say a couple words? Sure, I promise to come in a little bit in yeah. this. Um, Thank you. I don't know how many of you have been part of the Ukraine and the Environment um, special forum that was also now at Agent BW. I know that Samantha, at least, who, is, who I can see on the list of participants here, uh, was there as well. There is a lot of discussion there right now about uh, build back better and, and all sorts of kind of issues in reconstruction. But one of the things that came up in this response probably stronger again after many decades of it almost kind of starting to disappear is the question of unsolicited donations and especially like you know the bilateral donations that, that comes through it's been such a nightmare thinking about how scarce for example transportation capacity is for anything that would cross the border and how we are clogging it up with items that are actually not needed and that de facto will become based because uh, they have not uh, stemmed from any assessment that was done on the ground. So it's surprising that some of these topics are coming back up, even though we thought that as a community, we've probably already tackled a lot of these questions about uh, UBDs, about material convergence, about assessment and what prioritization and things like that. So it, it was a good reminder in a way that these things still exist, these problems still exist, and uh, we have to tackle them still. That much on that? Thank you, Genji. Um, yeah, so after uh, waste management, the next theme is reverse logistics, which is something that hasn't been explored very much, at least uh, within the humanitarian logistics literature. So, uh, but what we were able to find and what has um, been mentioned within the interviews are the recycling, repurposing, and remanufacturing actions that um, result from, that are very much a part of reverse logistics processes. And there are examples from the humanitarian um, context as well. So, for example, biodegradable materials, which are then easier to recycle. Uh, using biodegradable materials for the for the um, items that are being delivered as aid, um, repurp repurposing. So sometimes there are unused deployed resources, which then can be repurposed perhaps in another um, situation or then uh, used in different contexts altogether. Uh, then in terms of remanufacturing, there are plenty of small scale initiatives where uh, material from a humanitarian operation, such as, for example, car tires are used to make flip-flops. Um, plastic waste is being used to make building bricks. Um, these kinds of small-scale initiatives with enough support could um, actually make quite a big difference in um, these types of contexts. Um, now, this is the framework which uh, brings together everything that um, we've just discussed. So uh, the environmental sustainability, as you can see, is there at the top as in an umbrella theme. And then below that, we have the, um, the division into the sub-themes of climate change, performance, measures and tools, localization, barriers and collaboration, which was all discussed a little bit earlier. And then 
Um, we have the waste management and reverse logistics boxes. And um, technically, the waste management and reverse logistics boxes could al almost be replaced by any theme within humanitarian operations to as um, all of the uh, the environmental sustainability sub theme um, umbrella theme, pardon me, um, relates to to any of them really. So the waste management and reverse logistics are just the ones that we are using. At the, uh, we are interested in in this particular study, and then um, you can in the framework you can see that they are all very much connected, and they all. Um, all of the, the ones in the middle, climate change performance, et cetera, they all have a connection to both reverse logistics and waste management. So, um, sorry, I was just looking at the chat. Um, so now, are there any, any um, specific questions at the moment or should we head on into the um, discussion section? where we're going to divide you into breakout rooms in the interest of time since we only uh, have an hour. There's, yeah. there's one question in the chat from Samantha. Um, and she asks, you mentioned that there were some criticism of humanitarian organizations. And she was wondering if you could elaborate on that and explain which sector did you notice that that, that came from? Um, also, you mentioned the, that the objective was to provide a framework from humanitarians, and it would be would it be possible to explain a little bit about that as well? Um, yeah. Um, hi, Samantha. Um, thank you for your questions. Uh, so the framework is the one that is now up on the screen. So um, we use the word framework in in research a lot, and uh, often when we do literature reviews, this is what we aim to do. So this is something that could then be used in future research within environmental sustainability in the humanitarian supply chain management context. Um, since this is something that hasn't been uh, researched that much quite yet, so hopefully this will um, provide a basis that future research can be um, based upon. I don't know if Junji, if you have any Anything that you want to add to this? Are you there? No? I'm muting, takes a while. Uh, no, I think, as, as you said, I mean, frameworks are used in research quite a bit. And um, this particular one is something that we want to then, of course, populate with examples and, and, and see how things work out or don't. This has already been quite adjusted to the humanity and environment. When we look at now, for example, reverse logistics, we didn't take every single part of reverse logistics into it, but uh, more the things that, um, that can be tackled that could be relevant here. Uh, same for waste management, but we, we continue that discussion and we are, we are keeping on revising these things also based on the results from the interviews that we are having. Yeah, so the, the interview analysis or the, the analysis of the of the empirical material is still ongoing. So um, at the moment, this is purely derived from the literature. And then as Jinji said, we hope to populate and expand it as we um, continue analyzing our empirical material. So, um, and then, oh yeah, we, it was um, the question about the criticism. So this is something that actually arose from the literature that, um, uh, the criticism has, um, yeah, Junji, I don't know if you want to take this one as well, because, um, yeah, so the criticism really has become, that's just been, it arose from the literature that um, this has been awakened, <laughs> that there is a lot of waste, plastic waste, packaging waste, um, as a result of humanitarian operations. I don't think you'd find any criticism that you haven't heard before. No, it's exactly. all the kinds of things yeah. that usually hits the news first, and then eventually academic literature also picks it up <laughs> of uh, what kind of waste streams have been left, for example, after the disaster, uh, anything from textile waste to, say, the bottles um, of after delivering uh, bottled water. Very often it comes with quite a time lag between what, what happened in a disaster and when it hits academic literature. But this is where, like, you know, from literature, things come up, 
And then what we have, are here to discuss today is, okay, to what extent are these, for example, still relevant? As said, with material convergence, it was kind of quite a surprise that it comes back as a topic after so many years. And what we shall do about it? Uh, so there's an uh, addition to the question from Samantha. She's wondering if criticism sometimes comes from the beneficiaries themselves, for example, in the Ukraine response. So this is not something that we've encountered particularly in our research so far, but I, that doesn't mean that it doesn't happen. So um, I think people in the field are <laughs> more equipped to answer this question than we are as academics at the moment. But thank you, Samantha, for those questions. They were very good and very clarifying in a way. Um, but yeah, shall we um, start getting into our breakout rooms to start the discussion? Okay, hi everyone. Sorry about the confusion there. I was supposed to give you instructions before we actually broke out into the rooms and give you your topics of discussion, but then I guess the rooms just went ahead and <laughs> broke out themselves, so sorry about that. But I hope you were able to have at least some form of discussion within your rooms and you were able to um, discuss a little bit what we had, um, what I had presented earlier. Um, we still have a couple of minutes if somebody has any any questions that you want to ask ask everyone here there's we're not that many actually so we can maybe even see if we can um, discuss a little bit amongst all of us so anybody has any questions or any comments or or anything that they'd want to want to say We kind of ended up a lot more discussing greenhouse gas emissions than waste. Uh, so I was wondering from the other breakout rooms whether you had uh, a more focused discussion on say really waste management and streams of waste and things like that. Well, we ended up in discussion measuring waste, if it's important or not, but we didn't have time to end the discussion. <laughs> but we were talking on packaging waste mainly. Yeah, we had a. Um, we also talked about packaging waste and then some initiatives in terms of of reverse logistics. Um, we had an a, an example mentioned of playgrounds built from car tires, etc. So, um, yeah, it was a like at the end of the day, it was still a very <laughs> very interesting conversation that we were able to have in our breakout rooms. So. Um, Anybody else have anything to add or that they found interesting in the breakout room? Or just in general presentation earlier or anything that's come up during any other sessions of the, of the event? Hello. May... Oh, hi. Sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. <laughs> Okay, so I will quickly go ahead. So it's Francesca from WFP and uh, hi everyone. I just wanted hi. to add something, just a general uh, uh, thought about recy innovative recycling solutions because we were talking in the breakout room about a BHA and MIT uh, recent study about recycling uh, solutions that took place uh, um, in uh, the Horn of Africa. I mean, and uh, what emerged is that it, it actually some type of uh, technological innovation such as uh, uh, solar powered uh, uh, recycling machines or recycling devices would actually help together with the awareness campaigns to set up uh, take back schemes for waste, which would actually work very well in countries, for example, like Djibouti, where waste is everywhere and is scattered, scattered really all over the place. And it would actually encourage the communities to understand that waste is actually valuable and uh, it could actually help giving a second life to whatever is thrown away. But uh, of course it would require um, a lot of investments on the technological side and also on the communication side. And uh, it was just a, 
something that we were reflecting about with WFP and the exchanges in the last mission, and um, thought that could be an interesting point of discussion. Over. No, absolutely. That sounds super interesting and super relevant as well. And um, yeah, it, it um, really brings about the the question of contextualization, that in which context, what kind of initiatives would work. And so it's always really interesting to hear about very local local efforts and local initiatives, just to see what are the, the different factors that, that influence what works and where. So thank you, Francesca, that was super interesting. Um, Dana, you have your hand up. Hello, yes, I have a little different topic, but I would really like to draw a little bit of attention to this. Um, and uh, it's about this um, using the tires, the old tires for making new things like uh, you mentioned the flip-flops and the, you know, the kids' playgrounds. I, I posted in a chat a scientific article and that's about uh, some people, some researchers who tested those tires and found that they contain a lot of uh, these hazardous chemicals, actually uh, organic chemical, chemicals that should not uh, ideally get in uh, contact with skin and um, preferably not with children. And so I thought if someone is interested, we just have a look, look at it. It's the scientific data and but I feel like many people are not aware of it. Of course, like re reuse, it's, it's an amazing thing uh, from the waste management perspective, but on the other side, we also have to take care of um, not creating another problem. So so I think like the cart, the tires are better off like doing like a pots for flowers or you know some other purposes that are not like directly touching the skin. But it's a bit out of topic, but I still feel like uh, it's important to say because I've seen many of these playgrounds in Africa and so on, and and there's a little lack of, of knowledge about it. Uh, I did it as my PhD. <laughs> I, I don't think it's out of topic at all. I think that's a really important point to consider that recycling is not always, or repurposing is not always that straightforward, that you really need to also hear the context and yeah. and what things are used for really needs to be taken into consideration. So no, I don't think that's, that was super interesting. Thank you. And not at all, <laughs> besides the point, it was very much on point, I think. Um, we still have a few minutes if anybody has any questions or comments. Yes, please. Hi. Actually, as you know, what we cannot measure, we cannot uh, reduce or manage. Uh, I'm wondering uh, how we can measure unsolicited donation. And as you know, it's a huge amount of waste comes from unsolicited donation. And I'm wondering how we can measure it uh, to reduce it, to manage it. This sounds like a question for Janji. <laughs> yeah. Well, it depends a bit because I guess once you've received it, you can totally measure what is in there, you know, anything from weight to volume to whatever. But um, the bigger issue in unsolicited donations would be just to say no, but to be able to actually say no. And that's a really tricky part. Um, I'm not sure what the experiences of the group here are with that. I've seen all sorts of different responses to that. So maybe I just open it up, like what are your experiences? How did you manage to say no to something that you really didn't need that was coming in? Thank you. Sorry. I can give a little bit of feedback in terms of um, some past experiences with EBDs and, and the guidelines that we have. I think it really depends contextually um, and the strength of the National Disaster Management Agency and country, because you really, in my experience at least, need to link up with the, with the NDMA colleagues or, or to make sure that they're, they're coordinating really closely with the customs authorities. So when items are being received and trying to cross the border, you really have sort of a capture point to say like, 
no, please send this back or what's really in these consignments. I think another challenge that you find with UBDs is that often um, what's on the customs paperwork is not necessarily what's in, you know, in, in the cartons that you receive. Um, and that creates a lot of confusion and a lot of time for humanitarians to have to go through those goods at the border and say, okay, it was a box of miscellaneous aid items, right? Sometimes it has food mixed with toys, mixed with clothes, mixed with whatever people can put in boxes that they want to give well-meaningly, um, but it causes a lot of issues. I think also it's really about getting ahead of the problem. So when you have a sudden onset disaster, really making sure that it's it's clear from the, the onset um, that humanitarian organizations are not asking for in-kind donations or if they are, that it's very specified. And it's, again, linking up with the, the NDMAs and, and the customs authorities to make sure that it's very clear to the general public what's needed and what's not. But I think there's a lot of examples of, of well-meaning uh, disaster responses and emergencies, and they oftentimes uh, really get tied up with, uh, with the UBDs. So I think it really coordination is key, I think, in that aspect. Over. Okay, thank you everyone. Um, I at least had a very interesting discussion and I enjoyed this session a lot. I hope you did too. And um, like I said at the beginning, if you have any questions, feel free to contact either me or Jundi or Anna or Catherine. If you have any questions about REC or anything, and if we can't answer, we'll surely find out who can. And um, thank you so much. And for attending and um, have a great day, everyone. Thank you, have a great day. Thank Bye. You. Thanks. Bye.